The Deep End Consortium is a group of institutions and representative scientists looking to characterize the oceanic ecosystem of the northern Gulf of Mexico to infer baseline conditions in the water column. This information will establish a time series with which natural and anthropogenic changes can be detected. In response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill and the highlighted absence of baseline data for the deep Gulf of Mexico, that is depths between 200 and 1,500 meters in the water column, the Deep End Consortium will conduct a three-year sampling, sensing, modeling, and laboratory analysis program to assess ecosystem dynamics, identify drivers of variability, and investigate possible consequences of the spill on ecosystem attributes. Data obtained during the 2010, 2011, and then 2015, 2017 periods will establish a time series with which ecosystem shifts or responses can be detected. The average day for the Deep End Group out on a research ship starts with deployment of the MockNess net system. This system is computer controlled from the deck of the ship and is six nets in one. This allows for sampling at discrete depths. After several hours of fishing, the mock nest system is slowly brought back to the ship by a winch located on the deck. Once the frame of the mock nest system is secure on the deck, the nets are manually hauled onto the ship. Once the nets are manually dragged onto the deck of the ship, the cod ends or collection units for each individual net are emptied. Sorting the catch is a long process. Hey, don't 
Dr. Dante here for Biodiversity News. Uh, when patrolling out here in the Gulf, typically we don't get dragonfish quite this size. Um, this is a thread fin dragonfish, Echiostoma barbatum. Uh, you can see they've got this great set of teeth. Uh, you also notice that brightly colored organ behind the eye. That is a photophore. This fish produces light from that photophore. Also, off of the chin, you see this barbel right here. At the tip of the barbel is a structure that glows in the dark, and that is um, an organ that the fish uses to help uh, draw potential prey items into striking distance. But I just wanted to share this deep sea dragonfish with you because typically we don't get them this quite this size. Most of them are smaller than this. Uh, we just had a gliding squid uh, land on the deck. So these are very similar to flying fish in that they pick up a certain rate of speed and uh, leave the water and they can glide for a certain distance. Um, they've got a very characteristic posture to glide just like flying fish do. And uh, this one, unfortunately for the squid, uh, made its way up onto the deck. And uh, just wanted to show you here what they look like. You can see some of the chromatophores pulsing. That's the, the rapid change of color in, in this guy. Bioluminescence, or the natural production of light, is common in a lot of the deep sea creatures that we haul up onto the ship, including things like siphonophores. Bioluminescence is used for a host of different reasons in the depths of the ocean, including defense. This shrimp expels a glowing cloud of fluid, hopefully distracting a potential predator while it swims the other direction. Hey, Dr. Dante here. Uh, wanted to share an anglerfish with you. It's not often that we get larger anglerfish, and this would qualify as a larger anglerfish. Um, this is called Lophodolus indicus. It's a rare anglerfish. This is the 23rd ever known specimen. Um, you can see the elysium here, or the fishing rod, and the esca, or the lure, that glows in the dark. Uh, with a symbiotic uh, bioluminescent bacteria that lives in there. You can see it's got a, a big mouth for consuming prey items and an expandable stomach. But I just wanted to share one of the bigger anglerfish with you. We often don't get larger specimens, and then this is a really rare species. So trawling out in the Gulf of Mexico, working on the Deep End Project, and this is just a really cool species. Hey, Dr. Dante here, Life Aboard a Research Ship. Um, when I look back over my career, I think the things that I value the most are the friendships and the relationships that I've developed over projects. And um, I can't think of two finer guys than Tracy Sutton and John Moore. And every research ship trip has been a learning experience for me, but the friendships have just been amazing. And I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to the PI for all of Deep End, Tracy Sutton. Hi, I'm Tracy Sutton, and as Dante mentioned, I'm the director and PI of Deep End. Uh, but that's really just kind of a, a title, a bogus title, because really we're all kind of a big team. So I don't feel like I'm really in charge of anything. I'm mostly just in the background making these things happen, and then everybody kind of does their thing, if you will. So, uh, yeah, as Dante mentioned, it's been my privilege to, we've been friends much longer than we've been uh, colleagues per se, and Deep End was actually the best excuse we had to actually finally work together. So it's, it's just been a kind of a, a just an absolute thrill for, for me as well. Um, and one of the things that we've worked on together is this project looking at angler fishes, this group of deep sea fishes that have a lure sticking out of the top of their head and the interesting thing about that lure is that they don't make the light. It's actually a colony of specialized bacteria. And it's kind of a weird thing because only the females have the lure. And at some point in their light time when they're larvae, they don't have a lure. So at some point between when they're a larvae and when they're adult, they have to get those very specific bacteria in a sea of other bacteria. So it's actually kind of a fascinating process how the mother then passes on that ability to culture that bacteria to their offspring. So uh, the project that Dante came up with was we would snap the lure off of the angler fishes and then have our microbial team uh, do a complete DNA workup to identify those bacteria. So it's actually been a fantastic project. 
I uh, just had a paper accepted, so it's really kind of uh, one of these things that's kind of rolling along. So one of the projects now is to do it with other angler fishes. So for example, we have this lovely lady, uh, also known as Melanocetus. Let's see if we can get a better lighting. Does that look good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So here we have a lovely lady. And she has her lovely little lure, which might be hard to spot, but I'll see if I can lift it up a little bit. So that's it right oh, there. Yeah, yeah. So that's the lure, and that's the little house for these luminescent bacteria. And they're on all the time. So for her to be able to regulate the amount of light, she actually actually have a, a layer of skin that covers it up. So she can turn it on and off, on and off, by just covering up the bacteria with flow all the time. And then she feeds those bacteria oxygen and nutrients so it's quite the little symbiosis and it has allowed this group of fishes to be the most diverse group of fishes in the world ocean below a thousand meters where it's completely dark it's the midnight zone hey dr dante here i'm here today to talk more about life and water research ship and i want to introduce you to one of my good friends and colleagues dr john moore hello I'm John Moore, I'm an ichthyologist from Florida Atlantic University, and I'm one of the two ichthyologists on board who are pretty much identifying a vast number of the fishes that we collect on during this cruise. Uh, one of my specialties is working on anguilliform fishes, which are eels and such, and this happens to be a leptocephalus larvae of a eel. Now, leptocephaly are really specialized larvae for eels. They uh, have a very long, thin, flattened body that allows them to actually persist in the plankton for a long period of time, months to up to two years. And that flattened body provides them with a lot of surface area so that they can exchange gases. They have very tiny heads and very tiny gills, so there's not enough surface area do that just on the gills. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged through the skin. That tiny head also constrains what they can eat. So they feed generally on marine snow, which are aggregates, dust, and plankton, uh, molts, and mucus, and a number of other things, uh, bacteria and such. And it's enough to sustain these animals and allow them to grow over that long period of time. Hey, Dr. Dante here, and I am here with one of our cephalopod experts, and she is going to discuss what she does uh, with the Deep End Project. Hi, my name is Heather Judkins. I'm at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, and I work with cephalopods, so squid, octopus, their relatives. And for Deep End, I am one of the co-PIs responsible for cephalopod taxonomy, along with Mike Vecchione from the NOAA uh, Marine Fisheries Labs and we are here to identify cephalopods we collect and then they go out to a variety of projects. So um, some of the projects we do uh, barcoding. We will send some off for stabilized isotope analysis to see where they fit in the food webs. Um, there are also, some of them are being collected for contaminant work um, to examine if there's pH contaminants in the tissue itself. So it has been a great four years so far of looking at these cephalopods and identifying what we have out here at sea. Awesome, and what do you have right now? So right here we have a Mastigotuthis magna. It's one of the whiplash squid. And these squid, there's about four of them in this group. They get to be a little larger than this. Um, they are great food for predators, such as other fish, as fishes and marine mammals. So it's really exciting that we actually get one in pretty good condition, even though its tissue is missing a little bit on the top. Hey, Dr. Dante here. I am with one of our crustacean specialists with the event, and she is going to explain her role. Hi, I'm Dr. Tammy Friend from NOAA Southeastern University, Helmholtz College of Natural Sciences and Oceanography. And my role in Deep End is to work on crustaceans. We're working on micronecton, meaning that these, luckily for us, are crustaceans that we can see with the naked eye. We don't have to get under the microscope to see them. Um, what we do is we identify the crustaceans down to species. Some of it we can do out here for the easy ones. For the littler ones, where you actually have to 
count bristles on leg parts. We take those back to the lab. And we're measuring the abundance and the biomass and um, just basically doing a time series in terms of how things have changed since 2011. We get up a lot of crustaceans. Some of them are pretty rare. And one of the ones I'd like to share with you is this little beast called Metastomus gibbosus. And as you can see, as opposed to most crustaceans that you've probably seen, this one has a huge rostrum, this region right here, actually, this is the carapace. And the reason for this is this little shrimp lives at about 900 meters, and it's a very slow swimmer, so it's happily just swimming in the water column. It doesn't want to expend a lot of energy to remain buoyant. So what it does is it fills this region with am ammonium ion, which is lighter than water. And so half the time it doesn't even have to move. It can just kind of hang out there in the water column and not swim at all. This is a good strategy for shrimp that live at just one depth. But if the shrimp live at multiple depths, like the vertical migrators, they can't use this kind of strategy. Hey, Dr. Dante here, Life Aboard a Research Ship. I've got another piece of equipment that we're going to talk about today, the Echo Sounder. Hi, how you doing everybody? Uh, my name is Kevin Boswell. I'm a uh, uh, associate professor at Florida International University in the biology department and I'm part of the deep end program as well. Uh, my focus on this program is using acoustics and here we have uh, a suite of echo sounders that we're using to describe the uh, deep scattering layer in the Gulf of Mexico. So what you see here are a couple different panels and each panel represents a different frequency of sound. This is important because each animal or different types of animals reflect sound differently. And so we use multiple frequencies, kind of like uh, different spectra of, um, of colors that you might see. So this gives us a more complex uh, and informative picture of what's in the water. So we're looking through the, um, look through the water column here. We have the, the seafloor down here in these two uh, frequencies. And then we have the upper water column in these two. What we're really interested in are the animals that comprise this scattering layer. And so these are the organisms that move vertically every day. Uh, they go up during the uh, nighttime, they spend the night there foraging, and then they go back down at daytime. And so we're interested in trying, trying to capture uh, this behavior and understand how what we see in the, uh, the acoustics compares to what we see in the muck nest. I have somebody who is going to explain the net system that we use. It's called a mock nest system. He is our Mach Ness operator. This is Gray. Hey, I'm Gray. I'm the Mach Ness operator. So Mach Ness stands for Multiple Opening and Closing Net Environmental Sampling System. So if you look at the screen here, it kind of gives you a breakdown of all the different nets that we're sampling. Um, so we have Net 1, or Net 0, which samples from the surface down to typically 1,500 meters. And once we get to 1,500 meters, we fire the first net. So uh, on the upcast, it shows you different where the different nets fire. So here we have net one, which fish from 1,500 to 1,200 meters, and net two from 1,200 to 1,000 meters, net three from 1,600 meters, net four from 600 meters to 200 meters, and then net five fishes from 200 meters to the surface. So currently we're on net five on our way up. We're at uh, 165 meters. Our net angle is 45 degrees, which is the optimal angle for fishing and efficiency. Uh, we can, ranges of 55 to 35 are acceptable for a good tow. Uh, but we're doing pretty good on this one. Um, we've been in the water for almost five hours now, and should be back up at the surface in about 20 minutes. So if you come down, if you look at the data sheet here, here's what the typical data sheet looks like for a tow and cast. Same thing that you kind of see it on the screen, we just break it down, uh, we have different, di all the data that we collect, uh, net angle, flow count, and volume filter. And so that's pretty much a typical tow for uh, flying the Mach Ness. We are going to talk to one of the deep end geochemists today and learn a little bit about what Dr. Isabel does. Hello everyone, um, so my role here in the project in DeepEn is to assess a time series of organic contaminants in fishes and other animals like here I have Sigmops and Logatus 
and this is actually um, some females and the little one we don't know um, so what I do I look at uh, specific compounds for example a group that is called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and these compounds are uh, formed by rings of hydrocarbons and carbons and they are well known to persist in the environment for a long time also uh, you can find it in oil uh, burned wood uh, burn fossil fuels and a lot of stuff so we use we look at the composition of them and we can find out where are the major sources of these contaminants in the fishes also these contaminants in higher concentration they can be toxic to animals so we're using the animals and, and dissecting the animals and getting the different tissues to know where the contaminants are coming and the type of contaminants and the levels so when we compare, for example, gills and the liver, we can kind of know that if it's coming through the food web or it's coming through the water. Also, if we look at uh, compare muscle tissue versus eggs in ovaries, we can look at where the end member for storage of lipids and contaminants is in the fishes. And in this case, our last uh, study have shown that most of these lipids with their contaminants are being stored in the eggs. So now we're concerned about the next generation of fishes in the Gulf. So we're one continue to see uh, how contaminants develop over time, if they're decreasing or they're increasing or it's the same. So that's what I do here every day. The Gulf of Mexico is an amazing place with an incredible diversity of wildlife and we need to better understand the impacts of deep oil spills and how they affect the biological communities living there.